Hello, and welcome back to the Star Wars universe. Today we're talking about The Mandalorian, Season 1, Episode 7, The Reckoning. The one where the Mandalorian gets the band back together. All that and more after this ad we have no control over. Welcome back, Jeff. How are we doing tonight? Doing all right, sir. How are you? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. This is, um... You know, everything in this show is good, but now I I've forgotten how much I love this little two-part arc that ends the show. Um, I imagine you're pretty happy because we got Cara Dune back. And as we know, Cara Dune is bae. Cara Dune is bae. Cara Dune is bae. But I, I yeah, there's just – that line I said at the beginning, getting the band back together, that's really how it feels. You know, this is – he's kind of got to go back and find all the people he's worked with this season and get them all together to to put together this crew for – what's going to be the big final battle. Yep. I mean, chapters four, five, and six through this are like, they're good, but they're not part of the overall story. Yeah. They're a little bit and, day in the life. Yeah. They're, they're, they're just little, little snippets, little droplets of other things that, that could have been uh, in the life of the Mandalorian or just any bounty hunter in the galaxy. But right. when we get back into chapter seven and they, they finally decide to address the the giant elephant in the this corner of the galaxy um and and take the fight to the imps as they keep calling them yeah this yeah. show just oh my god the show is so good it and is. it it really you see that cohesive vision of somebody who just absolutely loves this this genre this uh this this franchise you know this all of the source material like you can you can tell every ounce of star wars love has gone into this at this point yeah so just a quick recap for those who haven't seen the show in a bit the mandalorian receives a message from grief karga whose town on navarro has been overrun by ex-imperials led by the client cargo proposes that the mandalorian use the child as bait in order to kill the client and free the town in return cargo will square things with a guild which will allow the mandalorian and the child to live in peace Sensing a trap, the Mandalorian recruits Cara Dune and Queely to assist him, and Queely brings a rebuilt and reprogrammed IG-11 to protect the child. They meet Karga and his two associates, but are attacked by Minox. I didn't realize those were Minox. Um, they certainly look a lot scarier than they do uh, inside the creature inside the asteroid. Karga is injured, but the child uses the Force to heal his wound. In return, Karga kills his associates and confesses his original plan to shoot the Mandalorian and take the child to the client. Karga pretends that Dune has captured the Mandalorian, while Queely returns the child to the ship. During the meeting, Moff Gideon's troops open fire on the building and kill the client and his bodyguards, trapping the Mandalorian. Car the Mandalorian, Karga, and Dune inside. Gideon arrives, demanding the child in the desert. Uh, demanding that the ch de yeah, Gideon arrives, demanding the child in the desert. Two scout troopers intercept the Mandalorian's communications and track Queely, killing him and taking the child. So yeah, there's a there's a lot going on in this episode. Queel. Queel. Oh, sorry, what did I keep saying? Queely? <laughs> you kept saying Queely. Yeah, Queel. Um It's who, okay. I, I, I because of I was like looking at him again, uh, let's just start with him. Like he is such a great story, and I, I probably should have realized this immediately. I had a suspicion, but this time I decided to uh check up on it. He was talking about his long period of imperial servitude and yeah. how um the things that he had to do and I don't think this is directly connected because I think they were already doing this before the Empire got there. But I did uh, check up on this. His race is the same race that is working the uh, cryogenic freeze pits uh, at Bespin. And that's where we've seen that particular uh, alien before. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're called the, um, I'm not going to pronounce this right, uh, the Ugnot. Yeah, the Ugnot. Ugnot, yeah. And he... Um... When being called that, he said, I have a name. It is Queel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, they kept I referring to him as that. It, it's again interesting because um, uh, just last night, actually, I, I rewatched uh, Rise of Skywalker. Um, still hate it, but that's another story <laughs> entirely. Say, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and Yeah. It, it, anyway, we'll, we'll get to that one day. Um, but I was struck by... I, I, one thing I, I did like about that was the storyline they started with Finn and they continued here of, 
you know, that the people wearing those imperial soldiers are not just, you know, all smiling, jackbooted fascists, that many of them are, you know, people fighting against their will and kind of impressed into the military or forced to do it for all sorts of reasons. And so I really liked getting to hear Quill's story here and having, yeah. um, you know, Kara, who was a, a, a rebel fighter, kind of really being hostile towards him at first. And then him, him really telling this, like, he, he stands up to her in a way where he's not saying, like, oh, I'm so sorry I fought for the Empire. Like, I'm so terrible. Please forgive me. He's saying, like, look, I had to do this, but I did it and I did it well. And now I'm free and I have nothing to be ashamed of. Um, yeah. And I really loved that. And I... It was interesting because Karin never says anything about it, but she just backed down in a way that makes me feel like, yeah, she gets that too. Yeah, yeah. And the the thing that really stuck with me when um, when Quill was saying all of that is that he said that he had done that for three of your human lifetimes. Yeah. That was a huge bomb to drop to, to, to say that he's been an indentured servitude. He's been effectively a slave to the Empire— for three human lifetimes and finally got away from it which and is his own master so i'm I, i'm glad you're focusing on that because i don't want to bring it up but that i think that's a continuity break because the empire lasted like 25 years did it yeah well good i mean the empire is formed <laughs> and like you know the empire is formed basically the year that luke skywalker is born right and the empire falls at about the time Luke Skywalker is like 30, 35. And this is set four or five years after that. So this is maybe 40 years since the beginning of the Empire. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure how he squeezed three. Like maybe like he was on a starship and it was going really fast and there was some time continuity thing that happened. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, there was time dilation. That was one of those uh, moments where he write. Yeah, and like without thinking about it, it's a great line. It's a powerful line. It makes no sense in the continuity, but I kind of don't care because it's a great line. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I'm going to go ahead and change the continuity in my mind. Yeah. I mean. To meet what his story is. You know, maybe the Republic wasn't that cool. Or maybe it was like, you know, he was first taken pl like on one of those separatist wor world, like long before the separatists, but on a world that was like doing terrible things because the Republic couldn't quite get out there, you know, so... You know, he was he working have for the, the Trade Federation or so, like I can I there's a way to head candidate. But Well, he, he would have been in that long before the prequels, even. Because right. Anakin was uh was what, eight, nine when uh when episode one happened? Yeah. And he was like maybe twenty five when uh the Republic was formed? Yeah, I mean, even just the period from the first pre prequel to the end of the Rise of Turn Skywalker is maybe 80 years, 90 years, you know, because like how Luke and Leia are in there. Maybe <laughs> That's like, one lifetime. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So. So, yeah, I, I the way I can head candidate is that he was on some planet that was not really cool with the Republic and was doing terrible things, which as the Clone Wars shows, there, there's a lot of. Um, yeah. and you know, so, so maybe that's how we justify it. He was doing indentured servitude to people who became the empire for three, three lifetimes. I can, I can buy that, you know, <laughs> for three of your George Lucases. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not probably going way too deep on one line of dialogue, but yeah. So to get all this great stuff from Quill and then have him die, that, that hurt, man. Oh God. Yeah. Just to, and like, not even have him die in like some great shootout or some big thing like it, it was just this tension building tension building tension building and then the next time they go back to to where he is you see all body. you see is the child in the sand and then it pans over to his body like yeah. you, he dies off screen like you still see the results of it of you know his body being there but he still dies off screen yeah Whew, and that, that it was heavy and like it you're right. Part That's of me wants blow. that big scene, but I think it's actually better this way. Like, I think it's yeah. more powerful, um, especially because part of what it left me thinking was if the droid had gone back with the child, would they have lived? You know, and is this not necessarily the Mandalorian's fault, but is this a little bit due to the man like the Mandalorian's just utter hatred and distrust of droids a little bit, you know, coming home to roost? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, probably. Yeah. 
I don't know that Quill would have necessarily allowed IG-11 to, uh, to, you know, take up arms immediately. Well, I think he says that, that, that he will help protect the child. Well, yeah, he said, like, he can be, he can protect, I think is what he said on the farm. Like, right. he can be, he can be allowed to protect. But, you know, that's one of those things that, that Quill has to basically turn on. Right. But um, it, but in this case, if him and Quill are trying to protect the child and they're there to steal the child. Yeah, he probably would have done something about it. Did, yeah. did Quill even have a weapon, though? I don't know. I, I, I feel like Quill had also kind of taken a, you know, I'm not going to fight any more stance. But yeah, yeah he I'm seemed, not sure. He seemed really, uh, really in the pacifist yeah. kind of stance. Uh, so what was your take on, um, you know, uh, the, the dragons at night and that whole like fighting, the, fighting the Mylocks? Man, that was a horror sequence. It if was, I've mine ever off, seen one. Hey, have you seen the movie Pitch Black? Yes. Did you not get that very strong vibe? From, from I them? did. So for those who haven't seen Pitch Black is, it's a Vin Diesel movie. Um, it's the... That's all you need to know. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, I think, the second of the Chronicles of Riddick or the first of the Chronicles of Riddick movies. It's very good in a, you know, Vin Diesel horror movie kind of way, which I love. And... To spoil just a, a very little bit, but this gets revealed very early in the show, um, they get stranded on a planet where there are these creatures who only come out when it's totally dark and hate the light, but will attack once it gets dark. And there's some really horrific, wonderfully shot scenes of they look kind of like the those Minox and then like swooping in in the moments of darkness between the between the flames going out and things like that. And it's just oh, it, it, it's a terrifying movie. And that was exactly what I was thinking about for this whole scene. You know, watching them just like the way they just like swoop in and grab people. They grab the blurg, uh, which was both oh. funny but also horrifying. Um, right? Like, this yeah, is it the was, thing that can pick up that beast. I, I think oh. that, I think that was in terms of battles. That was the best. Well, other than maybe the the opening battle in the in the first um, or the, the closing battle in the first episode. This was I think the best fight scene we've seen. It was just so well done. I'm thinking closing battle. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was so stuck on the uh, on the cantina. Oh yeah, <laughs> guy gets cut in half. Um, yeah, it was it was definitely one of the best shot. Like the the uh, the effects in that shot were phenomenal. Like the 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 smokiness of the area mixed with the light from the laser yeah. for, from the from the la- the the blaster bolts going out and like their light being emitted, but being kind of diffused through the whole thing kind of just gave it that extra spooky quality to it. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the blaster bolts just going into nothingness, not hitting anything. And there being what, seven people that are, that are shooting at these things Yeah, to try to, to try to defend themselves. And they're still just getting just mowed down. It was, Oh, it was terrifying. Yeah. Oh, it's so scary. <laughs> it's such a good scene. Such a good and scene. And I, I love that he finally got good use out of the flamethrower. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, this was the first both, time know, he actually nailed it. Yeah. I think he, he's nailed a couple people. No, he, like, he killed some people. Second on. Uh, he set a droid on fire uh, in, the, on the, in the last episode. He's done some good things with the flamethrower. Okay. He, uh, he roasted a, um, I think in episode three, he roasted a stormtrooper. Yeah. With it. And that was, ooh, that's a decision. That's a decision <laughs> you have to make. Well, I mean, more so even than his disintegrator gun. Um, yeah. <laughs> which we haven't seen in a little while. Um, yeah. So what is, um, we did in this point, um, we, we got the client back, but then we, we didn't really get more of the client. We just, and then we had him get killed, you know, pretty soon to get replaced by Moff Gideon. Uh, what's your take on uh, the farewell to the client and the, the new big bad we have? It was it was so unceremonious, the way that that happened. Yeah, and like I okay the they are these guys, um, John Favreau and Dave Filoni, and everybody else that was involved in this. Like they are masters of building that tension in the room, you know, in the in the the cantina where the droid is serving up drinks and you know he's can i offer you a libation yeah uh, in celebration of this occasion of the closing the closing of of our our shared shared narrative narrative. oh it's such a good line such a good line and like all the stormtroopers standing around 
being all imposing and the, you know, their armor being withered and worn and, and scuffed and scraped and not pristine anymore. And, and his, the, 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 the client's imposing just aura and everybody being so tense. Like it's such an amazing feeling watching this happen. And then that's all just torn away yeah. by a hail of blaster fire. Yeah. It's and like, at first I was kind of frustrated, but then I realized like it's actually perfect, especially because, but part of what I, is I wanted the client to have this like much bigger motivation, you know, and we get some of that. And I'll talk about that in a moment, but I kind of like the idea that, yeah, to the, these little people on this little planet, the, the client might seem like this, you know, big fish, but actuality, he's just kind of a middle person and there's a much bigger fish. And I, I liked that part of the story, the way it unfolded, especially the second time I watched it. Yeah. Um, and especially with the, the tension building, the way that it was like, it felt like there was no way out that the, the gunfight that was going to have to happen in there was going to be brutal and awful and nothing good could have come from it. And in the end, it just got ripped away and, you know, they, they tore the bandaid off and it's like, okay, we're, we're safe, I guess, but now we're in a worse situation. Yeah. <laughs> like we're safe a... from that immediate danger. We're out of the frying pan. We are now in the fire. <laughs> oh my God. What I was thinking of, <laughs> yep. I, I will say I liked, you know, I, I've talked with you and I've talked with Matt Carroll on other podcasts about how I'm not a big fan of the mustache twirling kind of villain. Like sometimes it can be good, but it can get a little old. Um, and I, we've very rarely gotten to hear why people believe in the empire beyond just, you know, Palpatine and his evil laugh and all that. Oh, and yeah. hearing this person really take this kind of like law and order, like, you know, things are better. Um, and it's funny in because every I think, metric, especially like growing up as an American, I always thought like, no, of course that's not the case. And like in our own world, we're seeing, you know, people in like a lot of countries and even maybe in this this country going like yeah all this like chaos of democracy not so great maybe just like someone in charge um and, and i kind of want to i'm curious like i kind of want to see the stats you know of like does crime go down <laughs> under the empire does you know and it certainly it seems true like if the new republic is totally falling apart uh and not really doing its job i get why some people would be like yeah maybe this uh the empire thing was a good idea um, yeah, maybe we should first order something. Yeah, right, right. Like, and that, that's the kind of cool part is it's it's kind of, um, you know, dictators arise in times of chaos because people want just an end to the chaos. And I feel like we're, you know, I I go back to my my thought on this all the time is I kind of like I don't want it to be what the show is about, but in the same way that like, you know, you kind of wanted Agent Carter to eventually lead to the formation of Shield and. I know Star Trek Enterprise leads to the formation of the Federation. I would love it if the last season of this show, you start to see the seeds of the First Order coming together. Like, because it, it 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 definitely feels to me like I now understand the ground in which the First Order could grow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially after that that amazing monologue from Mr. Werner Herzog. Oh God, it was so good. Yeah, <laughs> so good. Like, and he, he's, on the one just, hand, he's like fanboying for the Empire, but he clearly yeah, you're almost convinced. It. He almost got me. Yeah, and then he had to go take a call. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and what a great way to introduce the new Moff because the way he's just sort of like casually watching this chaos in his bar, you know, in the in the client's bar, and you you get the, you know he doesn't say a word, but he's clearly like, all right, I got to go show up there because clearly this is not going to work out. Um, I just loved all of that. And the, oh man. And it had to be, I don't know that there is a better person than Gus Spring. I mean, Giancarlo Esposito yeah. <laughs> to, to play the role of Moff Gideon and be that, you know, he's incredibly imposing without being a, a physically imposing person. Yeah. It's just the gravitas of his words and his voice and his, his tone, the way that he, absolutely knows that he owns the situation like this is how it's going to go you are nothing you know nothing like uh, i have only seen him in one thing uh, but what i saw him in was breaking bad in which he plays both this horrifically ruthless utterly terrifying have you seen breaking bad oh yeah oh yeah so yeah you, like he plays this very ruthless very terrifying don't you dare cross him 
drug kingpin, who at the same part also runs this Latino uh, fast food chicken place. Yep. And he often will be like in the middle of talking to one of the other characters about, you know, you better do this drug deal or else, you know, I'm going to like turn your family into chicken nuggets or something. Like he doesn't have to do his work, but it's that utter terrifyingness while being like, one moment, how may I take your order? Would you like fries with that? Like, and it's just the banality of it. I think is you're right. It's part of what makes it so terrifying because he's just so clearly like, well, yeah, I killing you wouldn't be a big deal. I don't have to yell about it. It's just like, I take an order for chicken. I give an order to have someone killed. What's the difference? Um, <laughs> And it, it, it's one of the most affecting acting performances I've ever seen. And he brings that exact same idea here. You know, he's just, he's so casual. Like, and yeah. I love it. Oh, yep. The, the gravity of him just being there and, and watching, uh, watching the TIE fighter come in and then have the, you know, the wings fold up mm-hmm. and, and the landing gear come down and just so gracefully present us with Moff Gideon like oh yeah my god my god sir this show (laughs) i i tell you one of the hardest things that probably the hardest thing i had to do today was hit stop at the end of episode seven right because it i mean it it is part one of a two-parter it's not like a separate uh, this is not a a bottle episode by any means and i just so badly wanted to see the rest of it so like you know loyal fans we're waiting two weeks for you um uh please be appreciative because oh it's so good (laughs) it's so good it, it remind, <sighs> you know what it kind of reminded me of? of, And happily, this is only two weeks. Um, when I went to go see Infinity War, the day it opened, Ugh. the first thing I said to to uh, my partner uh, as we were kind of, you know, wiping away our tears was, I have to wait nine months for the next one? <laughs> or however many months it was? Like, I think it was only five months, but even so, it was, yeah, that's how I felt about this one. And I, I've seen the second one. I know how it ends, but still can't wait for it. Mm. Yeah, it was uh, especially the the ending that we got where, you know, everything is so it, it's in such an empire state at the end of it, you know? Oh, yeah. Like our our heroes are pinned down. Uh the one guy has been killed and the baby has been kidnapped. Like the thing that we thought was the most good in the world is is taken away. Yeah. And <laughs> And our heroes are uh, against the ropes and they just, they just end it. They yeah. just end it. They just started playing the freaking credits and showing <laughs> us the, the concept art. Like, thanks for that concept art, I guess. Uh, can we get back to like saving the child, please? Yeah. I'm, I will say when the first time I watched it, I'm very glad I was binging it because I didn't have to wait more than 30 seconds to start the oh, next episode. God. Cause it would no. have been hell to go a week. When this came out, it was the Tuesday before Rise of Skywalker came out. Uh-huh. And I was like, why did they do this on a Tuesday? All the other episodes have been on a Friday. So after watching it, I was like, oh, they're probably going to have somebody in Rise of Skywalker have this this force healing, you know, cleric yeah. power, you know, <laughs> cure wounds, basically. Um and then they did. They yeah. they had exactly that. I was like, oh yeah, I guess they had to intro the power in the show. <laughs> Question mark. Yeah, it was a little uh, bit of like a you know Agents of Shield setting up some movie kind of a thing. It was kind yeah, of a little weird. Happens all the time. <laughs> um, so I I think that's about all I had to say about the episode before we go into spoilers. Though I do have a a big comment to make for people who have already seen Chapter Eight. Uh, is there anything else you want to say before we drop the spoilers? Uh, I am appreciative that this episode gave us one of the best. Uh, Star Wars related memes that we've gotten in recent years. Oh, what's that? Uh, with uh, the client saying, I want to see the baby. Oh, for some reason, I've not seen that as a meme at all. Oh, man. That's okay. So look up anything that's like, we're having a Zoom meeting at work and I hear a dog barking or I hear a cat meow, something like that. Uh, and it's like, you know, when the when you're in a Zoom meeting and the the boss's cat meows, your reaction, and then it's Werner Herzog saying, "I want to see the baby." <laughs> I like, like that. That's really appropriate. That's a good meme. That's a phenomenal meme. Happily, that has not come up yet in any of my Zoom meetings for work, but I've had a bunch, so I'm sure it will someday. All right. Anyway, so, let's. Uh, uh, for all of those who are dropping out now, thank you as always. Please check out um uh, ways to support the show. 
Um, we really want to build the audience. So please, um, if you're interested, if you want, if you like the show, if you want more people to know about it, it would be awesome if you could leave us a review, a five-star review, or however many stars you think we deserve. Um, do that, but also, um, you know, tell your friends about it. Forward an episode to, to some people. Post about it on your Facebook, on your Twitter. That's how we build this. That's how we get more people involved. And that's how we keep the conversations going. Um, and so for everyone else, um, spoiler warning, we are now going to talk about the events of the episode, what we know about the rest of the show and how that informs what we just watched in three, two, one. Oh. Well, thank God they save him. <laughs> well, thank God they save him. But also, <laughs> well, sort of. But Kind of. But also the Mandalorian hating on the droid. It hit me so much harder this time, knowing that that droid is go- IG eleven is going to sacrifice himself to protect the child. Right. Um, like, oh, it just tears you up. We were um, on the other half of this show when we talk about the Clone Wars. We've talked about how Star Wars has such a like weird back and forth about the respect it plays to droid life because you get people like C three PO and R two D two who are like dear members of the family and we care about, but then most of the droids, especially like the the battle droids on the other side, are just you know them dying Fine. is just a laughable thing. And now we've started to get more like you know the the um, the droid who dies at the end of Rogue One in like this you know heartbreaking way. The the droid who dies at the end of Solo, one of the only moments I cared about in that show. Um, and here <laughs> with a you know Taiko Waititi bot. Um, uh, you know, giving himself up. It we'll get to that scene next week uh, or two weeks from now, but just knowing that's coming makes all the times that the Mandalorian just doesn't trust him. Just oh, it just hits so much harder. Yep, yep. Especially like when when IG Eleven has been trained to serve T, when he has been trained to basically be a housekeeper and and be the nanny, so to speak, nanny bot. It just, when you know all of these things about him and when you know the sacrifice that he's willing to make and the things that he's willing to do to protect the child now, like, all of the hatred, all the malice yeah. that the Mandalorian has for this for this droid and other droids is is just, you wonder how, you wonder how somebody can get to that well, level of hatred. But that's what this show is so good at, is that they just told us this guy doesn't like droids because they attacked him when he was young. I think we'd be, it would be very easy to be like the Mandalorian's being stupid. But like we have watched him get PTSD about droids because of the horrifically, you know, I talked a while ago, like they somehow managed to make battle droids scary in the flashback scenes. Yeah. And, and I think that's part of what makes it also much more hard to think about is like the Mandalorian's totally wrong and he makes things harder by being stupid about it. But given the horrific thing that droids did to him and his family and his world when he was a child, I, I can't blame him either. Like, because you're right. We know exactly where that hate comes from. It's from fear. It's from trauma. And and it was pretty horrific. Yep. <clears throat> and then because of his hatred, because of his fear, because of his trauma, someone else yeah. died. And someone else that he cares about well, both of them he cares about, but somebody that he cares about died and somebody that he deeply cares about got kidnapped. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's just, there's so many layers to that scene, you know, and I feel like I could watch it two or three more times and still get more and more out of it. Um, yep. That's about all I had, though, because I mean, like, we only have one more episode left, so there's not a lot else that I can inform, but it just, I'm just, I, I know exactly what's going to happen, but I'm still so ready. I'm so ready to watch the rest of this. Right. Like, I feel like I need to go and watch the uh, the chapter eight Again, like, right about the time we finish recording. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you know, as long as you can keep the thoughts fresh for the next time we record, I'm down. So. No, I'm going to watch it again in two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, go for it. I like that <laughs> idea, too. All right. Well, um, to listeners who stuck around with us, thank you again so much. Like we said, um, follow us uh, on Facebook uh, and on Twitter, uh, Star Wars Universe Podcast. Also, this podcast is part of the Stranded Panda Network that uh, Jeff and uh, his podcast partner, uh, Matt Carroll, helped to found. On that network, you'll find the MCU cast, a DC On Screen podcast, a uh, Star Trek Universe podcast, uh, Binger's Assemble, uh, which on which Matt and Jeff have done a number of great episodes about X-Men movies, and I've done recently a whole rewatch of uh, Altered Carbon. 
uh, you know, a nice light family show about robots and droids and uh, artificial <laughs> intelligence. Um, <laughs> oh, that show is so good and so intense. If you're under 18, do not watch that show. Well, I don't, who, who cares? Uh, <laughs> you know, but think of that, that show as a Deadpool kind of a show. It, parents, if you don't want your kid to see Deadpool, don't take them. Don't let them see all the carbon. Um, Speaking of... We're actually going to be uh, covering Deadpool coming up for Avengers Assemble uh, nice. because there's a, there's a rumor going around on the internet that uh, Disney is gearing up to release the New Mutants on Disney Plus or some other digital platform oh, uh, very soon. Okay. So we're going to be like, we're, you know, crank it down and like, all right, we got to get through Deadpool and Deadpool 2 then. All right. Sounds good. I look forward to seeing them. Um, so yeah, a lot of great podcasts, a lot of great content. Um, uh, uh, Matt Carroll does a lot of good music too. Other great, you know. Uh, so if these podcasts are helping you out while you are um, stuck at home and, and quarantining, that's great. Uh, and uh, drop us a line. We'd love to hear about it. Uh, if you are listening to this while you're traveling back and forth to Essential Work, thank you so much for the work you're doing. Um, we really uh, are so grateful for what you're doing and that gratitude, frankly, is nowhere near enough. I hope that the uh, our country is going to start doing a lot more to take care of you all. But for now, I hope that this uh, is providing a little bit of entertainment. Uh, let us know what you think. Find us on Twitter, on Facebook. Email us, Star Wars Universe Podcast at Gmail. Uh, all these links are on the show notes. Thank you very much. Have a great day. I've spoken. Yes, you have.